Hey there. Um, I want to talk about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus in Romans 8. Um, it came up in a conversation today and I shared some things I I've, I've see about it. And so I was like, oh, you should do a video. Um, I'm going to try to keep this somewhat short because uh, I have already covered this a lot in my Romans series. In Romans 8, I hit it pretty strong. And anything I've talked about related to sonship... Uh, I hit this one because ultimately the law of the spirit of life is to eventually produce an atmosphere of sonship and confidence in you, which is life and peace in contrast to a spirit of bondage and fear. It is for the purpose of liberating me. It is the operation of Christ's life in me to liberate me from a spirit of bondage and fear and bring me into this atmosphere of sonship, which is the base of a holy life, uh, which is the base of freedom in Christ. Um, the law of the spirit of life is not something that you obey or something that you do. The law of the spirit of life is the principle of operation in Christ's own life to free you. It is the liberating power of resurrection and see, Christ has been installed in you. Uh, Romans 8 tells us that if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Christ is in you. Your spirit has become life because of righteousness. And that's because he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit, and he dwells in you there. Okay, And in your spirit, Christ is operating. Your spirit has become the Holy of Holies. And in your spirit, you have a high priest who's also seated in the heavens. He joins heaven and earth in your spirit. And he intercedes for you in your weakness, in the power of his incorruptible life. And that intercession is a release of his life to you. So the purpose of your high priest is to give you life. That's why high, help Melchizedek comes with bread and wine, right? Uh, Melchizedek came to Abraham with bread and wine. That's a type of Christ coming to us with his life to minister his life to us through intercession in the midst of our weakness. He takes us upon himself and responds to our weakness as if it's his own. And that is in Romans 8 too, right? The spirit, uh, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the spirit uh, intercedes with us uh, in our weakness, with groanings that can't be uttered. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes according to the will of God. And that's how God works everything according to good, or everything out for the counsel of his will, everything for good in the life of a believer. It's through the intercessory, intercessory ministry of the high priest, Christ, who has been given authority over everything in heaven and earth, and has become head over all things to his body, which is the church. He has that kind of authority. He can, he can do anything through his prayer <laughs> and he lives in your spirit. And Hebrews says he's touched with the feelings of our weaknesses. Why? Because he is there to respond to them with his intercession. And it's as if these weaknesses are his own. He's that fully identified with us. He's put you on. Just like we put on Christ, Christ has put you on. And he feels your weakness and intercedes to release life and strength, life and peace. Okay, But primarily, the purpose of that is to bring you out of bondage, condemnation, and fear. And bring you into liberty, peace, and joy, and life. That's why he ministers. That's what <laughs> he is ministering himself as bread and wine for your enjoyment. His life is for your satisfaction. And uh, so the introduction of this law of the spirit of life is there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not according to the flesh, but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, the law of sin and death he's been describing in the last chapter, in chapter 7, 
And that was where Paul, in the laboratory of his own experience, discovered that sin is operating in him as a principle apart from his own will to make it happen. In fact, he wills to do good, and yet he discovers a law in his members that when he would do good, evil is present with him, and that the law of sin is actually aroused the motions of sin are aroused by the law of god and his agreement with it to take advantage of the situation so that when he would do good when he would say okay i'm not going to covet sin worked all manner of covetousness in him and he said what then if i will to do good and i end up doing the thing i hate then it's not i who do it but the sin that dwells in me so we learn in romans 3 that there are individual sins uh, defined by the law, Romans 1 through 3. But then there's this principle called sin, singular, which is a law. So the law of sin and death is operating in my members, and it's stronger than me, and I can't overcome it. That is the discovery of Paul in Romans 7. And it brings him into despair. It brings him into condemnation. And it brings him into a spirit of bondage of fear. Okay? So, he says, oh, wretched man, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? His whole being is full of death. Uh, this is kind of what Luther experienced when he finally got to the end of himself and said, the just shall live by faith, ring in his mind, you know. Sometimes Christians are brought to a place of absolute defeat because of their scrupulous desire to be pleasing to God in their heart. And they find that when the law says, you shall not covet, the law of sin in their members works all manner of covetousness in them. Covetousness has to do with what is the desire of your heart before you even decide to do anything. It's the sin that dwells in you that's actually why you're condemned. You know, it, before you even sin, you've already sinned. That's what Jesus is talking about. If you commit adultery, you, if you lust in your heart, you committed adultery already. You're condemned for the things that spontaneously come out of your heart, uh, even without you deciding to do them. And that's because we are condemned because of Adam's transgression, and we all fell into death because of him. Because of one man's transgression, all died. And death has reigned in sin through death. And so Jesus had to die for us to deliver us from this terrible condition. But we need to be delivered from condemnation. Now, condemnation here is different than condemnation in Romans 3. Romans 3 is talking about the court of heaven, that you were judged guilty before God and condemned, okay? But God set forth Christ as a propitiation for your sins and justified you when you believed and manifested his righteousness in the heavens. Now that is true whether you feel condemned or not, whether you feel guilty or not, whether you despair or not, whether you repent or not, or feel sorryful or not. When you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose for your justification, you are justified in the court of heaven. It's called alien righteousness. It's something credited to your account apart from you. Okay. Um, so... That has nothing to do with your inward state. That's something true in heaven. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And you are an heir. But on the earth, you still have this situation with the law of sin in your members that can you bring you into condemnation. And that's why so many Christians struggle trying to believe that their sins were really forgiven. Because they feel the weight of condemnation. Condemnation is a weight. It is a spirit of bondage and fear. It makes it so you think God is mad at you. It makes it so you feel like you can't approach him. It makes you feel so dirty and defiled and so hopeless. And you despair because you cannot overcome these things. And you're so conscious. Your conscience is so overly awakened to the law. Okay? And you're you think God is holding you to it. Now, you know that you're forgiven, and yet you can't overcome the condemnation. And so those kind of people, you say, 
you know, no, you're forgiven of your sins. I know, I know, but I just can't. And no matter what you say to them, they can't ever seem to shake it. They're gripped with a spirit of bondage and fear. That comes from the flesh. That's not demons, okay? A lot of people think it's demonic oppression. No, it's actually the state of the flesh trembling at Mount Sinai. (laughs) This is what you would have felt if you were at the bottom of the mount and God revealed the law. You know, that's what, that was terrifying. Moses said, I exceedingly qu- fear and quake. It is standing in the presence of God without knowing how to put on your armor. <laughs> uh, t- <laughs> he is a consuming fire and he's been installed in your spirit. So you've been brought near to the presence of God. And if your mind does not, and, you're, and you don't know how to deal with, sorry, if your mind does not know how to be renewed and filled with life and peace, and you don't know how to deal with this presence, it will produce eventually feelings of shame and fear and condemnation. Why? You've been brought near to God, that's why. So that produces a kind of weakness in one sense, okay? You weren't living in the presence of God before. You were strong to sin. You didn't even care. That's how I was. I was able to sin and sin and sin because I didn't believe in God and nothing mattered. When I got saved, after a while, I started fearing all the time about my salvation and my inward state. Um, Because no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't control my heart. Uh what erupted there and the law would come and condemn me. I was so conscious of it and I was just full of fear. And I thought for years, maybe I'd lose myself. I mean, all the different things. I still believe that Jesus forgave me. If you said, did Jesus forgive you? I'd say yes, but I don't think he likes me or I think he's displeased with me or I, and you come up with a million different reasons to justify the feeling of fear. And you say, well, that's because at the judgment seat, I won't have any rewards. Or sanctification is by works and I'm, I'm not doing good. And I'm not growing and I'm not a good disciple. And I'm not reading my Bible enough. And you come up with all these reasons why you feel this way. Well, the reason you feel this way <laughs> is because you're under condemnation and you're gripped with a spirit of bondage and fear. And what you need is something to set you free. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ is for that. Okay. It is the principle of operation in his life, in his priesthood, in resurrection, that causes him to intercede for you in weakness, to deliver you from that. It's for delivering you from that. But it requires something from you to get the benefit, which is to walk in the Spirit. So he says, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And the NIV and the NASB and the corrupt translations take out uh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And I used to favor the NASB because of this verse. Because to me, I thought this meant that I'm condemned if I'm in the flesh from God's point of view. That it, it almost seemed to undo justification. How could that be, you know? If I have to walk in the Spirit in order to be justified before God, then there's no way for me. That must be a mistake, you know. Now I understand that the condemnation here is not talking about the court of heaven and your justification. It's talking about your condition on earth and setting you free from the spirit of bondage and fear and condemnation. Okay, so... uh which is death. It's weakness before God, and ultimately it's death. So that's why, in a few verses later, Romans 8 says, If you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You've got to learn to what does it mean to walk in the Spirit. Now, because we are legalistic, we think walking in the Spirit means when I'm being good and obeying the law, And when we're walking in the flesh, that means we're being bad and not obeying the law. But according to Romans 7, the flesh is the totality of my natural man corrupted by the law of sin so that when I would do good, evil's present within me. 
There's a law of sin that's brought it into death that produces condemnation. Again, I didn't deal with this condemnation before I was saved. I didn't want anything to do with the law of God. I didn't care about it. It wasn't until after I was saved that I had this new desire that I delight in, in the law of God according in my inner man, you know. I was awakened to the word and I started reading it voraciously and eventually I got to Matthew 5 through 7 and found out that I'm condemned if I call my brother a fool. I'm in guilt, I'm in danger of hellfire, you know. I found out that my heart was being scrutinized and I couldn't take it. And the more I tried to take to clean up my heart, the more I found the law of sin erupting. The law of sin works so that it's like gravity. The higher you jump, the harder you fall. And some people who have never felt the weight of condemnation as believers, all I can say is that they've never scrupulously tried to actually obey the law in their heart. They never tried it. If they actually had, they would find that the law of sin is stronger than them. It's easy to not really understand gravity if you only jump six, inch, six inches off the ground. <laughs> but you go, ah, that's nothing, you know. But if you jump off a building, you'll discover that gravity will kill you. <laughs> so it's that kind of thing. It's that kind of law. Um, now, the law of the spirit of life. No, I'm teaching, sorry. Um, the law of the spirit of life is for setting us free from the law of sin and death. But it's as we learn to walk in the spirit, okay? Walk after the spirit. And Romans tells us what that means. Romans 8 tells us what it means to walk after the spirit. First of all, the law could not do something. It was weak through sinful flesh, right? So God had to do something. He had to terminate. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and condemned sin in the flesh. Now that is not talking just about judging it. That's talking about actually nullifying its power. He did that in the body of his flesh. You can never die to sin. And by the way, the key is death. You can't die to sin. If you died in your sins, you would be resurrected in your sins. All the people standing at the great white throne judgment didn't die in Christ. And so when they're resurrected, they're still sinners. And they're going to still blaspheme God. His presence is going to bring it out of them. They're going to be standing there cursing. They're going into darkness. We be gnashing their teeth, and the gnashing of teeth there is uh, rage, if you look at the Greek word. They're going into hell in rage, cursing God. Their sinful nature will still be there. We can't die to sin, but Christ condemned sin in the flesh. He terminated it. He accumulated it. All the sins were put on him, and he literally killed it. Okay? And so, uh, this is uh, good news. But Romans 6 says, he, in the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. And it's on the basis of that that we are to learn to reckon our old man as crucified with him and reckon that we died to sin in his death. It's not our death to sin, it's his he condemned sin in his flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, according, but after the spirit. The key is this walking after the spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now the carnal mind, again, we think, oh, that means I'm just setting up my stuff on my, my desire on my appetites. No, the carnal mind is in Romans 7. He's desiring to do good. And he's in absolute agony that he still can't get rid of the covetousness and the law of sin in his nature. And it's getting worse and worse the harder he tries. Some people don't believe that's true. And all I can say is you haven't tried. And I don't know anybody who <laughs> tried as hard and as long as I did. Uh, you know, these new Christians come along and say, well, you're just carnal and weak. You know, I can do it. Oh, no, you didn't do what I did. You did not. Go spend 35 hours a week with people speaking mostly Chinese in order to keep the oneness of the body of Christ and participate in its building and and give yourself as a living sacrifice for 10 years and give everything to follow 
what looked to be the New Testament way. Uh, and I'm not boasting, it was stupid. I mean, in a way it wasn't, but I counted all as loss for the excellency and knowledge of Christ. Um, I know what it means to give it my all. And not just for a minute, but for a long time. And find out that I'm bankrupt. Um, and that was my carnal mind pursuing spiritual things. The law is spiritual. It's holy and good. But I'm carnal. I don't match the law. And if I try to deal with it, it will deal with me. It'll discover that I'm carnal. It'll, it'll discover that there's no good dwell, dwelling in my flesh. The carnal mind is the mind that is interested in pleasing God to merit a wage or to put God in its debt. It wants to be righteous. It wants to be spiritual. It wants to be good. But not for Christ's sake, but for its own sake. And that's the fatal flaw, is that it seeks its own glory. So that it is its pursuit of religious attainment and spirituality is actually covetousness. That's what Paul discovered, was that his religious pursuit was covetousness. And that was the problem with all the Pharisees. They desired glory from man. They couldn't... They, it was covetousness, we'll just put it that way. Uh, and so that's carnally minded. You think that you're after spiritual things, but you're actually lusting after the things of God. Trying to gain them as a wage, rather than receiving them as a gift in Christ. Um, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It cannot be subject to the law of God. Okay, So... And we, again, the point is not, oh, it's the sinful mind and you're just thinking about your drugs and your sex parties. That's what people think carnal means. No, carnal means I can't embrace spiritual truth. I cannot understand the mystery of Christ. My mind is not renewed. It is still a mind set on the flesh trying to perform in the flesh. Right? Uh, and the root of it is covetousness, but it thinks it's righteousness. And it eventually becomes angry at God. That's the end result. And I get people all the time telling me that this is their struggle. You know, I've been dealing with, been trying to clean up my heart and I can't and I'm getting madder and madder. That's the fruit, you know. When you try to handle yourself according to the flesh, that's why Paul said in Galatians, you know, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap from the flesh corruption. Be careful, you're going to bite and devour one another. You're going to be consumed of each other. Because the flesh, once it's stirred up, even in their, their, their pursuit was to try to keep the law and perfect their flesh by the law. But they were strengthening their carnal mind and their carnal flesh, in, which is in opposition to God. So it's really deceptive because the way sin works in this kind of setting is that when you would do good, sin works evil in you, but you think it's good. You think it's righteous. Paul thought he was doing God's will when he was persecuting the Christians. Uh, you think you're serving God, but you're animated inwardly by a hostility to God that just hasn't been fully revealed and uncloaked yet. <laughs> and you can be like that as a Christian, okay? But the, re the that's the end of if you don't get delivered from the spirit of bondage and fear, it'll eventually produce rage. If you don't Get rid of the condemnation. It'll eventually set you at odds with God. That's why the law works wrath. It's not that it makes God mad at you. It makes you mad at God. The legalist is the angriest person in the universe. Some of these people who are doing the videos, the legalists, you can hear the barely contained rage behind their supposedly calm demeanor. <laughs> You can hear it. You can feel the rage. They're so angry. Uh, but anyway, he says, and here's the answer. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you are born again, you have the spirit of God dwelling in you. And you are no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. Even though you have the flesh and the mind of the flesh, the problem is, you dwell in this body that has the law of sin. It's dead because of sin. And your mind 
needs to be renewed. You need to learn to walk after the Spirit. How do you do that? Well, it's by the setting your mind on the things of the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh, verse 5, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 5, I skipped that verse, uh, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit mind the things of the Spirit. Now, the things of the Spirit is not law-keeping. The things of the Spirit are, is the mystery of Christ and all of the good things he has in store for you <laughs> uh, and what he's accomplished for you. Um, when Paul talks about the Corinthians, he says they were carnal, which means that they couldn't, they were only on milk and they could not ingest meat. And he said, but we do preach a wisdom among those who are more mature, even the hidden wisdom, which God predestined to our glory, uh, which is the, the mystery, God's wisdom in a mystery. And he talks about the things of the spirit. Uh, first Corinthians three, um, He says, oh, it's at the beginning, I guess. Well, I thought it was 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, I could not speak to you as carnal, but unto, uh, a spiritual, but unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. I've fed you with milk and not with meat, for hereto you are not able to bear it. Neither are you able, for you are yet carnal. Okay, then he talks about the strife. Uh... I'm going to have to do a search real quick. Wisdom mystery. Sorry about this. Here it is. It was in the chapter before. I'm sorry. First Corinthians 2. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before to our glory, which none of the princes of this world, had they known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man, save the Spirit which is in him, the Spirit of man in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things freely given to us of God, which things we speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He can't know them because they're spiritually discerned. Now this is what he's talking about when he talks about milk versus meat carnal versus spiritual he's saying that the natural man can't receive the things of the spirit of god it takes the spirit that searches out the depths of god and these are the things of the spirit of god that the natural man cannot mind and that was the root of their problem at corinth was that they were not spiritually minded they did not understand the mystery of christ and he said i couldn't even talk to you about the mystery of christ i had to speak to you like babes putting you on milk I couldn't give you the meat. The meat is not perfecting yourself according to law keeping. The meat is the mystery of Christ. The meat is the deep things of God. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. The hidden wisdom, which is now openly revealed. It's called the mystery of Christ. And it's the riches of Christ as our inheritance. Okay. Um, the mind set on the spirit is the mind that is occupied with these things. See, the mind of the flesh is occupied with, I'm a slave and God demands something of me and I want to please him. And so I'm going to find out what he wants me to do. And he serves according to the letter. That's what it talks about in Romans 7. This all comes out of serving God according to the letter. The letter of the law kills. The letter kills. But the spiritual man sees that he died with Christ. Died to sin and died to the law. And he died to the law so that he may be joined to Christ. And now he has a union with Christ. And Christ is in him as life. This is the mystery of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The spiritual man and the man that 
can mind the things of the spirit is not necessarily a less sinful man. That's not the point, although it does produce the fruit. The point is what is your mind occupied with? The carnal mind is occupied with the law of God and it produces condemnation and fear. But the spiritual mind is life and peace. So he says, uh, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells with us, and if Christ is in you, where is it? Oh, here it is. Sorry. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now that word life is zoe, and it's the same life that's in your spirit. And it comes from Christ. To be spiritually minded takes the revelation of the Holy Spirit, which you have from God. We received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us from God, because the spirit searches the depths of God and reveals these things to us. Well, Romans 8 says that the spirit also searches our heart, and he who knows the mind of the spirit prays according to the will of God. The searching spirit is within us. He searches the depths of God, and he searches our own hearts. And for as far as the depths of God, he reveals those things to us so that we can have the mind of the Spirit. And as far as our hearts are concerned, he searches out our weakness and gives them to Christ for his intercession. And Christ, in, in his intercession, operates by the law of the Spirit of his own life, the law of his own life, to liberate us, okay, and to release his life to us. I know this is deep. This is, I thought I'd do this quickly, but... Uh, walking according to the flesh means I can't understand spiritual things. Being carnal means I can't understand spiritual things. And spiritual things begin and end with our identification with Christ, our death with him, and his life in us. It is the realization that the way I live now is by another person. I live by someone who's been installed in my being. Regeneration meant another person moved in, and he is there to give his life to me. And to live righteously means that he animates my members. Remember in Romans 6, it talks about reckon yourself dead and then present yourself as one who's alive from the dead. Don't present your members to sin, but present them to Christ as members of right, instruments of righteousness. Uh, you're presenting yourself to someone else for him to live in you. That's the gist of Romans 6 through 12, <laughs> is that there is someone else who wants to live in your body, Christ himself. And that is the beginning of spiritual knowledge. It's, you know, carnal man can understand that he's justified in the court of heaven and he's going to heaven. But a spiritual man understands that Christ is in him as his life. The carnal man, to him, that's foolishness. He's veiled. He can't see it. He can't receive that kind of truth. The spiritual man is the one who has enough experience with his flesh that he's sought a deliverance. And that actually, behind that, seeking for deliverance was the intercession of his high priest, Christ, praying for him in his weakness to bring him to a place of desperation, you know. And in that desperation, he learns that he was according to the doctrine of Christ, baptized into the death of Christ. He died to sin. He died to the law. There's no demand on him. He's in the tomb. He's buried with Christ. And now Christ is in him as life. And his living must be Christ. Christ has to rise up in him and do what he couldn't do. Christ condemned sin in the flesh. He couldn't die to sin, but he died with Christ. And now Christ can be the fulfillment of the righteousness of the law within us, but it's not as we focus on law keeping, but as we turn our focus onto spiritual things, namely our sonship and our inheritance. So that's where he's leading to. Okay, so he says, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life is because of righteousness. That's actually your human spirit. But if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Yes, that's talking about glorification ultimately, but what he's really talking about is the righteousness of the law, 
But what is the source of the righteous spiritual life that actually is holy and has the fruit of holiness and is free from this vicious cycle of sin and death? It is Christ in you giving you his life by his spirit. That's the key. And that comes first to your mind to fill it with life and peace. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Now, what it's really saying is you're no longer debtors. You're not debtors to live according to the flesh. You don't owe the flesh an apology. You don't need to clean it up. You don't have to deal with it. It is dead. It's been crucified. You are now free to, from debt as an heir of God to deal with Christ and with his spirit. He says, if you live according to the flesh, you shall die. What is dying? Dying here is condemnation. He's talking about freedom from condemnation and fear. But if through the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. I need to learn to walk according to the Spirit. And then Christ's death to sin is applied to my members. It's not my death. It's the Spirit applying the death of Christ. The cross has power to deal with my sin, full nature, with my body. It would subdue it so that if you walk according to the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh, according to Galatians. For you have not received a spirit of bondage again into fear, but you've received a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father, here it is. Everything has been building up to this point in Romans 8. the law. This is the center of gravity. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus operates to set you free from condemnation and from the spirit of bondage and fear by making your life, uh, mind life and peace and breaking the carnal, carnal grip of your mind and causing you to have the mind of the spirit by revealing to you things related to the sonship. Okay, When you turn from the law and being a slave, thinking that you are in debt by the flesh, to God and you need to put God in your debt for a wage and instead see yourself as a son and an heir and change your pursuit from that of seeking to do good as according to the law to seeking to know what is yours in Christ. Now that you are an heir seated at the table, you will have a shift and you will start walking according to the spirit. And the spirit in you is the spirit of sonship, okay? This is what he's doing. He, you have not received a spirit of bondage again to fear. See, you received another spirit, and it's not compatible with the old spirit. The old spirit that you are acclimated to in your flesh is one of bondage and fear. Whenever it comes near to God, it gets all terrified. And God is the smoking God at the top of Mount Sinai delivering the law. And Moses is fearful and everybody's quaking at the bottom of that mountain and it's terrifying. That's the flesh. The flesh cannot stand in the presence of God. And God has been put right at the center of your being. What are you going to do? <laughs> well, you need to learn to walk according to the spirit. Because you've not received a spirit of bondage and fear. You've received a spirit of sonship. See, God is a father. If you are in this flesh, you're a slave. But if you are in the spirit, you are a son. And if you're born of God, you're a son. If you're justified, you're a son. But we're talking about your condition. How do you approach God? Do you approach him like a slave full of fear? Or do you approach him in the sonship with boldness saying, Abba, Father? You've not received a spirit of bondage to bring you into fear, but a spirit of sonship in which you cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself or itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So uh, if so be we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. And people get stuck on that one and say, well, I got to suffer. No, that suffering is the groaning and the longing to be clothed with your glorified body. Every believer who has the first fruits of the Spirit experiences a kind of suffering in this life because he longs to be clothed with life and doesn't want to be in this flesh anymore. 
Okay, now this is called the leading of the Spirit. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The spirit, you have not received the spirit of bondage again into fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now remember, this is the Spirit, not from the world, but from God, who searches out the depths of God, concerning the things that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man, the things that God prepared for those who love him. Inheritance, right? And the Spirit bears witness that we are children of God, God, and errors. When we turn our mind to start seeking out what is mine because I have an inheritance in Christ and I'm already an heir and I'm no longer a slave. And you start to even talk to the Lord that way. Lord, thank you. Your blood not only justified me in the court of heaven and freed me from God's wrath, but, and I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. But you transfer me out of the kingdom of darkness and into the, into the kingdom of the Son of your love. And you've qualified me by your blood to partake of the allotted portion with the saints in the light. And you've blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. And I'm accepted in the beloved, and I was predestinated under this sonship to be holy and without spot before my Father in love. And I have all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of you. And you've given me all things and you withhold nothing from me. And you're working all things together for my good. And if God is for me, who can be against me? Right? In fact, Romans 8 takes a turn here from talking about the spirit of bondage and fear to a triumphal place where he's like, what can separate me from the love of God? Angels, principalities, things present, things to come, death, tribulation, sword, famine, nothing. I'm convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ. And I know he's working all things together for my good. And He, those who he justified, he also glorified. And he's predestined me to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn from among many brethren. And uh, firstborn from the dead among many brethren. And the whole universe is groaning for the marvelous deliverance of the sons of God into their liberty. It, it takes, it becomes a triumphant thing. So we go on this journey from being under condemnation and in a spirit of fear to being prevailing. See, Paul even captures the spirit of it in his own expression. Here he's talking about all this science stuff about how the way the spirit works in us and to free us. And we don't want to walk according to the flesh because that's death, you know. We don't want to have our mindset on the flesh because that's hostile to God. And, oh, wretched man, who should deliver me from the body of this death? Oh, Lord. Then he starts saying, look, you've not received that kind of spirit. You've received a spirit of sonship in which I cry, Abba, Father. And if you start to take your position as a son and turn your mind from law-seeking to Christ-seeking, Christ is your inheritance, and that you are co-heirs with him, and you start praying, Lord, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation so I can know what's mine in Christ, you will see that there is a triumph in the Christian life. And this is a continuation of a thought that goes all the way back to Romans 5 where he said, that because of his life and because of his grace, we will reign in life. Reigning in life means that you are triumphant and nothing can defeat you anymore. And defeat means nothing can bring you into condemnation before God and bring you back into that spirit of fear where you don't know what to do and you're not even sure you're saved. <laughs> It's sad that most Christians live there. Many do. And guess what? You know whose fault it is a lot of times? It's the jerk who's trying to put them under law. I always think, you know, it would be funny to do a message. What if Christians don't seek God because you're such a jerk? Because there's these legalistic Christians who like to say, you know, some people just don't seek God the way I do. And they need to be taught how to, um, they need to be discipled properly and taught devotions and and I'll teach them how to, you know, no. The reason they're not seeking God is because of people like you that make it seem so arduous and tell them God's going to punish them if they're not holy enough. Tell them God might kill them if they're, if they're not holy enough. You put them under the law and treat them like slaves. You beat the servants. No. 
we have a spirit uh, of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father, and the Spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are children of God. And this is the source of strength in the Christian life. Because when my mind is life and peace, that atmosphere of Abba, Father, the atmosphere of sonship permeates my heart. And then what I do is righteous. It's not that I'm not free to do what I want to do. I want to do all kinds of things. I play the piano. I do YouTube videos. I take care of my kids. I do what I have to do in my life. I'm free. I'm not waiting on instructions. I'm just doing what I do. But because my mind is renewed, because I've learned who I am in Christ, and I know how to agree with him, I'm learning how to tap into this living fountain of water that is the source of righteousness in the Christian life. And it is something that spontaneously sets me free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do in that it was weak, well, sin, weak through sinful flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who, believe, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And that's why there's no condemnation for me. There's no condemnation for me while I'm walking in the spirit. The devil can lie to me all he wants. You guys can all do 150 videos about me a day and you can't bring me into condemnation. That's not how I was 10 years ago. Somebody did a video about me or said something bad about me. I would collapse under the weight of my conscience. Maybe I'm a false teacher. You know, somebody did. I mean, no, that the Lord has set me free through the renewing of my mind. This is what it means to have the mind set on the spirit, and this is the leading of the spirit to bring you into the atmosphere of sonship so that your mind is compatible with who you are in Christ, and there's life being released from your spirit into your mind and then into your body. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he also who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal body. What kind of life? A righteous life. Yes, it's the fulfillment of the law, but I'm not looking at the law. I'm looking at Christ. See, what the law couldn't do because of the weakness of flesh, you know, Christ is now in me to do by supplying life. But it takes my participation in one thing. i got to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. And that's why Paul says in Romans 12, I beseech you based on the mercies of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of the mind is the key. We present our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, which means acknowledging the truth that I died with him and that I'm now alive with him. And I'm presenting my members to him because I expect that he's alive in me to live the Christian life through me. But now I need my mind renewed. I need to be transformed by the renewing of their mind. I need to not think the way the world does about God. I need to think about it the way God, according to his spirit that searches out the depths of God, reveals him to be in me. Okay, now our weakness. See, the next thing it's going to talk about is that they who have the first roots of the spirit grown within themselves, they don't know how to pray as they ought, but the spirit intercedes in their weakness. Our weakness is that we don't know how to stay in that position. Every day, I need to renew my mind or I can be back in the flesh. And if I'm back in the flesh, I can, I can talk to you in three weeks and if you haven't been f renewing your mind, you'll be under condemnation. I talk to believers all the time who were clear on grace a few weeks ago and then they're like, man, I don't know, I just feel, I feel like I'm not doing something, I'm not praying enough. And that's why you see people on YouTube go back and forth between the works channels and the grace channels. They'll be clear on grace, and then three weeks later, you'll find them going, well, I know I need to love God, and I don't. And I... Why? Because they're back, in, they're, they're back in the flesh. So we have a weakness because we're in the flesh. And Christ is here, and this is the law of the spirit of life. He is here to intercede for us in that weakness as if it's his own. He's in us, and it tr just like our desire to do the will of God used to trigger the law of sin in our members. Now, our weakness triggers the law of the spirit of life in Christ <laughs> so that he intercedes for us. His 
high priesthood is not according to the order of a carnal commandment, but according to the power of his indestructible life. And he's there with bread and wine to minister to us. And what he does is he intercedes to make sure that all things are working together for our good to bring us into glory, even our weaknesses. And he even arranges through his intercession to bring us into situations by his authority where everything seems to be against us so that we are so conscious of our need and our weakness that we really cry out to him and say, oh, wretched man that I am, if we're persisting in our own strength. He knows how to orchestrate our defeat. He knows how to orchestrate our checkmate. That's part of his leading. But that's just the beginning. Once we get to a place where we are finally listening to him and seeking him, because we have no hope in ourselves anymore, we know nothing good dwells in our flesh, then he can start by the searching spirit to reveal the things God has prepared for us concerning our inheritance and start acclimating us to the spirit of sonship, which is a sweet atmosphere. It's no longer God's screaming from the mount with the sound of a trumpet and everybody's shaking and say, don't ever let him talk to us again. But Abba, Father, and this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's been credited to you, and you're accepted in the beloved, and you are a fragrance of Christ unto God, and he's satisfied with you. He's pleased with you. Even though you have all this stuff going in your complex being and the law of sin and all that stuff, and your carnality, he's installed Christ at the center of your being, the real holy holies, to intercede for you and bring you into a place where he can finally tell you about your inheritance that he secured for you. Because justification makes you an heir. Um, so that's really kind of my view of the law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life is not the same thing as I will write my laws in their minds and in their hearts and cause them to walk in my ways. This is something that actually does involve our participation to teach us, to train us, and to discipline us how to know what the flesh is, know what, how bankrupt it is, and turn to Christ for deliverance, and then begin to explore the mystery of Christ and the inheritance that has been secured for us by the Spirit, so that we have the mind of the Spirit, and what we begin to experience is life and peace it, that replaces the condemnation and fear. And we begin to experience the atmosphere of sonship in our heart, is filled with the love of God. Again, this is all Romans 5 being worked out, where he says, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and we rejoice, and we stand, let's see, wait a second, let me, uh, by whom we have access into this grace in which we stand. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, patience, ho experience, experience, hope. And hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which he's given to us. For while we are yet without strength, Christ died for us. It's the same thing. Romans 8 is talking about how the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. As he brings you into the mind of the Spirit through all kinds of trials and stuff that are designed to bring you again and again to mind the things of the Spirit until you're at home in them. And once that becomes your home, you'll eventually see that the spirit of bondage and fear is the alien place, and the spirit of sonship is home. Whereas when we start out, actually we're more comfortable with the spirit of bondage and fear, and it's so hard for us to grasp the sonship. It's so hard for so many believers to live even five minutes without that feeling of condemnation. It's not demons. It's a spirit of bondage and fear. And the answer is to turn your mind from your performance to Christ and what he accomplished for you. All right. Um, I'll go ahead and upload this. Hopefully this will help some people. It's another long one. I, I've been talking a lot today. <laughs>